Uh, well, today, uh, thank you very much indeed, um, everyone, for, for attending. Um, today is the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, um, 21st meeting of 2019, and we will be looking in the first agenda item at Scottish Elections Reform Bill, and uh, we have with us uh, two uh, guests, um, Pete Wildman from the Scottish Assessors Association and Malcolm Burr, who today is representing Solace and the Electoral Management Board for Scotland. Um, welcome to both of you. What we're going to do um, this morning is you don't need to make any opening statement. You'll probably be relieved to hear. Uh, we'll, just get, we'll just go straight in and uh, you can develop the, your answers as you go along in concert if necessary. And Maureen Watt, can we first ask you, please? Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, in previous sessions, the committee's heard um, that combining electoral events can cause voter confusion. Um, that's something that um, I find quite difficult because in some countries you get votes for presidents, parliaments, local government all at the same time. I wonder if it's because we use different electoral systems. But from an administrative perspective, um, which is where you're coming from, is it important to decouple electoral events? And if so, why? Uh, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to, uh, to, to join you this morning. As, as you've noted, uh, convener, I'm representing two organisations uh, today. Um, the, con the conventional, the evidence seems to be, and I think it followed the 2007 elections, is that combining elections is undesirable uh, on grounds of the, the best interests of the voter. Uh, I tend to share your view on a personal basis that I don't always see why that should be. Voters are always clear, uh, in my view, uh, where contests are separate. I mean, that, that's, that's hardly unknown, and by-elections are often combined with with general or, or parliamentary elections uh, without detriment to either, I think. But administra administratively, it's certainly more complex. Uh, it increases the risk, inevitably, uh, of something not going quite right. Um, and there is an argument, uh, it's not, for, not really for me to say whether it's correct or not, that, that one election is diminished by the presence of the other and inevitably that would be seen to be the local election tends to get consumed with, with national issues and therefore that's detrimental to the, to the process in, in, as a whole. Um, from an electoral registration viewpoint, it will depend on the franchise. If there's differing franchises, so a parliamentary run with a local government type franchise, we would have to produce two different um, registers for the polling stations. Um, so you've got um, clear, you'd have to do that anyway, but it, it, it's, there is just that risk of confusion as to who can vote in which election. If there was a general election. And yes, I mean, local, any, any local election, you, you would have a combined register because people, some people would be able to vote in one election and not in the other, so you'd have to have a clear... Um, but a Scottish Parliament election and a local government election, it's the same register, isn't it? It would be the yeah. same register, yes. Okay. And is there a benefit to you as electoral administrators in having a well-established schedule of electoral events, even knowing years in advance, which, for example, you do more or less for a Scottish Parliament election? And what are the consequences for you and your members um, of an unscheduled electoral event like we're in at the moment? <laughs> Well, we will we will cope uh, as as ever, and uh, thankfully the support mechanisms and, and these I would include the the electoral management board in that are there and, and are well established and are well used uh, to support snap elections. That is, those are perhaps inevitable, but it is of great benefit to the process where there is a, a clear schedule of elections. I come back to uh, the Gould the Gould report uh, following the, the 2007 elections where he recommended very strongly uh, that no changes are made to electoral law or practice uh, more, less than six months from the date of the poll and inevitably uh, where, there are, where there are unscheduled elections uh, that there can be changes that, that, that come at very short notice and we, will, we manage it of course but it just increases the risk and 
Uh, it, it leads to uncertainty for, for voters, for candidates, for parties, for everyone. So wherever possible, um, yes, a schedule is greatly to be preferred. Yes, I would back that up. It just reduces the pressure on you as you are delivering the election, producing the registers, um, getting registration through, working with the printers on uploads of data. You've got time to consider that, consider the messaging. It, it's not that you can't be done. It, we, can, we can deliver elections at short notice if need be. The risks and the pressures are just slightly higher. <coughs> And in terms of the electoral cycle, does it make any difference to you whether it's four years uh, or five years? Um. Um, not, not really, not really. I mean, it, it, the, point, the point is to have a, a schedule that, that is known, known in advance. I think it, we, I would just have to say it's a policy decision as to whether four or five year terms are, are to be preferred. And as local government um, representatives, does it make any difference to you in terms of four years or five years? We've had the, we've had the experience of, of both. Uh, in the, 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 the term is officially four, but for the last three terms, it's been, it's been a five-year term. Um, the arguments, I think, are well known. Uh, if it's a four-year term, you have quicker accountability. Arguably, if it's a five-year term, you've better... That there's, a, there's a longer period to develop policy, to consult, to engage. It, it's a matter of political political judgment. Um. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Maureen, and thanks for the answers. Um, just moving on from that then, um, and uh, linked to some degree, is a potential postponement of general elections to the Scottish Parliament, and uh, the bill, as proposed, would enable the Parliament's presiding officer to propose a date for the Scottish Parliament's general election, um, if the Parliament was already dissolved, is it important that such a provision is included? And what circumstances can you envisage that this actually may be needed to take place? We would support the provision uh, simply because there needs to be some provision for, I think we gave an example of public health emergency. Um, these, kind of, these kind of events, and it, it's obviously hard to... Uh, hard to foresee them. Um, I think I think we also mentioned in our response a flu pandemic. Where there is advice that uh, people should not go about and make contact with each other, uh, clearly uh, it would be detrimental to the electoral process where, where we're still required to run an election in these circumstances. It would likely affect turnout. It would certainly be off-putting for for everybody concerned, could people campaign? Uh, all of it. it would be detrimental to the whole, the whole process. So we think it's it's right. There's a there's a process for doing that. Obviously, we would want that to be uh, consulted on with the EMB, with the Electoral Commission, uh, and and everyone else <coughs> involved. But it, it does seem strange um, that there is no such provision at the moment, and we would welcome that being there. You would. Well, that's, that's handy. So well, we. Would you be planning for such eventualities now or at any point? Would you, would you, I don't know if you'd have to wait until you could foresee something coming, or would you have the idea that maybe these type of things should be planned longer term just to be prepared in case such an eventuality happened? Certainly if the bill becomes law, uh, I would hope we would meet with the presiding officer and set up a, a process that we could take off the shelf, as it were, yeah. uh, in, 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 in case of these case it was required. Right, OK. And uh, Pete, uh, I know that um, in 2007, because I was involved at the time, um, with the two elections, it was seen um, from the people that I spoke to at Glasgow City Council as being quite a heavy burden that they were carrying then. Yeah, I, I think the circumstances that come to spring to mind, I was involved in the um, Cat Manager by-election in uh, March where you had uh, beasts from the east and the weather conditions were uh, really bad. You could see in that circumstance, those type of circumstances, it may be sensible to postpone the poll and therefore um, the mechanism there outlined by Malcolm would be a sensible, you could see that being used in that situation where last minute, just ahead of an election, you realise that there are particular issues. Well, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, and Mark, please. Uh, the phenomenon of voting early and voting often, um, is, that, is that something which you think is particularly widespread in local elections? What, 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 what would you estimate as to what that level of fraud is? 
I, I, that is perhaps one, uh, certainly in terms of um, registration, I'm not sure that that's really, I think it's probably one more for Malcolm in terms of um, returning officer, but it's really what you're talking about is personation, people actually voting more than once in, in one, yeah, one area. Um, my understanding is um, incidents of electoral fraud are very, very low, um, uh, okay. so I'm not aware of that being a significant issue. Okay. That's, that's indeed the position. Uh, we have thankfully very, very, very few cases. Yeah. Okay. What about multiple voting, though, where people are on different registers? Yeah. Um, perhaps for, for you know legitimate reasons, somebody's moving, might be at university or, or have a job in one place, and they're on multiple registers. Is that, do you think do you think the the incidence of multiple voting in that situation is is quite widespread? So you've got people who are le legitimately on the register in two separate places. So I'm not, I'm not aware of that being a significant issue um, right. uh, being reported. Mm -hmm. No, Jim, have you? Yeah. Right. Jimmy, Can yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, good morning. Um, it, it's just a, a relation to that. Um, are there situations where people, because this isn't going to stop people being registered on a number of registers, are there situations where there is, um, uh, you could see a cause for people voting in two different Two different, uh, two different council areas. Yes, it's it's a policy choice. I mean, they're legally and in principle, they are separate contests. I mean, you can be on two registers quite legitimately. Uh, if it's two local government elections, they are they are clearly separate separate contests. Uh, there is perhaps something that emotionally goes against the grain about about voting about ha having more than one vote. Mm. Uh, but it can it, it is purely a matter of policy choice and people mm. can be legitimately resident in, in more than one place mm -hmm. and students are a good example and I'll, I'll defer to my colleague on how that's how that's um, how that's managed um, uh, he may also want to comment on on uh, how that if if it's if there's a wish not to have that to happen that there, there has to be a that that would have its how would that be how would that be managed mm -hmm. um, would we need um, diff a different system of registration available of course to polling staff mm -hmm. um, so that there are a number of practical considerations but uh, <coughs> it, I think it's effectively a policy choice as to whether it is simply felt to be right that people can vote more than once but they are separate contests and it's the accuracy if you could only register on to onto one to one register. register. I mean that would, would clearly that, that, that would clearly <coughs> be a provision that would be necessary under the yeah. current system. Yeah. Tie into some of the arguments about completeness. I mean if you're measuring completeness against say the <laughs> census population, a lot of the census is often done when universities are sitting. Um, but actually students in practice don't always register at universities. The anecdotal evidence we have, they prefer to remain, reg they register, connect more closely to their home address, although they have option to register at both. Um, and student registration at university addresses it tends to be relatively low. Um, and I think that reflects their connection to their home. They see home and they understand their, their home politics. That's anecdotal evidence. I don't have empirical evidence to back that up, but that's certainly what we we get, what, what we hear as registration officers. That should be another issue which is just failing to register at all. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a student, for example, where they're not at home, someone else fills in the form, this per, you know, the, 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 the child isn't, is, the, the person isn't resident in the home at that point, but then the university isn't helping students to register either, perhaps, and the they the just fall between are, the gaps. I have to say the universities are very helpful across Scotland, and we get supplied with full lists of all the students resident, um, along with email addresses. So we email the um, students, we advise them. So, so in my own area in Stirling, I've issued um, uh, three emails to all the students in the course of the last month, um, inviting them to register to vote, um, and um, registration levels are still relatively low, probably about um, 600 on campus. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting case in point because I remember the European elections, the number of students registered on the university campus looking at the electoral roll was incredibly low mm -hmm. considering you've got several thousand students actually. And we, we attend Precious Fair, we will promote this thing, so yeah. okay. it is a voluntary Go. system at the end of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Jude, um, detail of what qualifies 
someone to be able to vote in two different or more places? And is there a limit to where you can register the number of times? Um, student, in terms of... I'll, I'll let Malcolm answer in terms of the voting side. In terms of registration, um, the position in Scotland is that students can register twice. They can register at their home address and they can register at their term time address based on case law. And um, for... Um, other residents, you, it's where you carry out your main business of life. So um, if your main business of life is in one place, you can only register one place. There are certain circumstances in the, in the case involved an MP who carried on their duties as an MP in one area and was a lawyer in another area. That was held they could register in both cases because their main business of life. It would depend on the fact and degree as to whether you can register. Um, but most people tend to have only one place where they carry out the main business of life. So we're, we're actually primarily just talking about students, and they're only allowed student, to... Yeah, I mean, there, are, there will be others, but the others are relatively low. It's in, certainly in Scotland, it's mainly students that register twice. Yeah, having a, a home somewhere doesn't qualify in any No, way. not if it's just a, a holiday home and it's not something used. something like that. Yeah, yeah. And do I, from what you said, do I take it that you can only register in two places, not yes. multiple yeah. places? No. Right, no. OK, thank you. Yeah, and Neil and then Jamie, please. Could you repeat the bit about where you have your main business? Yes, yeah, the case basically focuses on where you carry out your main business of life, and that is is quite a is something we would ask people to evidence and what how they do. I think you, you could technically see somebody registering maybe in three places if you can see that you know, can actually carry. Some people do indeed have three residences, and that actually spend equal amounts of time in those three residences and carry out substantial. That scenario is not impossible, but um, it's very unusual. You're getting to very low numbers there who could do that. Yeah, it's just interesting you, member, you, you mentioned a Member of Parliament because yes. some, some have got five jobs. Um, interesting. I wonder how they can register. Many times they would have to register, but thanks. <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, well, thank you for that. It's actually quite interesting. Um, and Jamie, please. Uh, thanks. The bill proposes um, allowing all 14-year-olds to register as... Uh, attainers. So, are you supportive of that? Um, is the current system kind of overburdensome? What are the advantages? The current system is linked. It, it, the current system dates back to when the register was made up once a year, and it was where you lived on the 10th of October, mm -hmm. and it was a, it really didn't change during the course of the year. And it, you, it's the age of which you become voting age in the December following the year in which the register is published. It's an incredibly complex um, piece of legislation so um, as at the 30th of November in a year very few 14 year olds can register because they won't be turning 16 mm -hmm. in the period of the December through to the following November mm -hmm. however as soon as you go past on the 1st of December most 14 year olds can register because they will turn 16 in the following 12 months that is an incredibly complex message to get out. Mm -hmm. um, so in the forms, it says you are four, if you're 14 or over, you can register to vote. So we'll get people adding 14-year-olds onto the register, and then we have to write back saying, actually, no, you're too young as a 14-year-old. So their first engagement with us is us actually knocking them back. It's a lot easier for all of us <coughs> and for public engagement to simply say, if you're 14, you can go on the register as an attorney. You can't vote until you're 16 but you can go on the register at 14. It makes engagement a lot easier, it makes messaging a lot easier, and avoids confusion. And that really, I think, is the heart of it. And you, you want it to be clear and easy for 14-year-olds to understand where they, where, they, where they can register and when they can't. And you don't see concerns, or you don't see any real issues when it comes to voting, that those 14-year-olds may feel that they're entitled to vote because they've been told they're on the register. No, I mean, it, it is very clear that you can't vote until you're 16, and the yeah. messaging that goes around elections is, is very specific on that. Okay. Um, <coughs> and I think we touched on this a moment ago, actually, with students, but taking it back to, 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 to even uh, younger people, um, do they take up that invitation to register to vote? And do you think, do you think you know, having that longer time frame will, will encourage uh, more... More time. If you, if you were to set it at 15, the, the danger then is that you would get somebody who was, when the annual canvas came around, they were only four, they were 14 years, 11 months, they wouldn't put their name on. By the time it came around next time, they were 15 years, 11 months, it would be too tight. So 14 yeah. is, is the logical one from a practical viewpoint. Um, sorry, I've lost the, uh, your, your question there. Um, well, well it, was just, um, it was just basically, well, were you, were you expecting to have more 
more people registering to vote. And this and actually it moves on to slightly what my next question is. I, I, I think I think one thing I would say at that age, a year, two years, three years is a very long proportion of your life at 14 compared to um, uh, somebody of my age. Um, but what we will see is engagement ahead of elections. So <coughs> ahead of the Scottish parliamentary elections in 2021, when 16 year olds can vote, you do get engagement and engagement is very is a lot more straightforward because anybody under 16 is within full-time education of some form in some shape so you can actually message and target that very effectively and the schools have a good role to play in promoting awareness and understanding and there's a, there is evidence to suggest if you can get people to vote at 16 they will they get understand the process and will vote uh, later on can i ask then, how many people this will add to the register do, do, do you, do you prefer, I do you don't know off the top of my head. It will vary, as I said, because the number of 14-year-olds during the course of the year will vary who can register and who, who can't. Mm. Um, I, I could come back with a figure, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. And um, just in terms of the, uh, the use of the data, this will obviously, uh, because, because more people will be on the register, more people will be, or more younger people will be able to be engaged with in terms of by political parties and other areas or is there protection there is protection in okay. there the, what, what is that? the 14 and 15 year olds data are not disclosed um the only exception to that is in the run-up to an election um uh, candidates political parties will get the details of uh, 15 year olds who will be 16 <laughs> by polling day so it's a quite a small subset of the 15 year olds um, and even then they don't know that there are the uh, attainment ages aren't appearing on the register so you won't know who is um 16 so there is that protection there is that protection in place Malcolm, can i can i ask you is there anything in relation to this that, that from, from from a from a practical point of view from a local authority point of view no we're, we're very supportive of it uh, just just as improving participation in the process and preparing both ourselves and uh, and potential electors better that's great thank you okay well thanks very much for that and uh maureen please Oh, Neil, Neil, big fun, Neil Finlay. In terms of um, widening participation, and particularly in terms of accessibility of the process, what changes do you think we need to make to ensure that we're making voting as accessible as possible to as many people? Well, I, I think we we do relatively well um, in terms of in terms of encouraging participation, and the un and the last question has has I think uh, given another means of doing that. But the the board is very keen to see the provision for piloting of other voting methods. I think that's uh, th there is a lot of evidence out there from from uh, from many countries, uh, and that's sometimes positive and sometimes negative. Uh, but there is certainly interest in, in electronic voting. Um, <coughs> I could go on and on and on, and I won't unless you ask me to about, about the issues involved in that. But suffice to say, the bill gives, um, gives exactly what uh, we would be looking for, which is um, pilots, uh, the, the, the authority to conduct electronic voting pilots <coughs> and then anal analyze the results of these. So I think that's, that, that's a, a good... That's a good a good way forward. I will ask you going on and on in a minute, but um, <laughs> uh, in terms of the uh, <coughs> accessibility issues, has there been research done and analysis done of the participation rates of, say, people with disabilities or BME uh, members of the community or you know other minorities uh, compared to you know the general population? Uh, yes, there has, and not, not by the EMB, of course, but I think the Electoral Commission has conducted quite extensive uh, work on, on participation rates, and of course they've done some specific work in relation to the ordering of the ballot papers, uh, and, and that's that's been quite that's been quite illustrative. Um, so yes, and we would want to that that would be a key element of any any. Um, pilot and any evaluation of a pilot of any other of, of, of means of voting. What's your view on all postal voting? I I think it is best to have a mixed system. Uh, the one thing about <coughs> postal voting, uh, ac it gives maximum accessibility and, and convenience to the voter. Of course, the, the one thing you cannot 
uh, be sure of in it that the voter is is voting in a secure and a safe and a threat or reward free environment. You just don't know that inevitably. And it's it's interesting. I think the evidence from Estonia, which is probably the most advanced European state in terms of electronic voting, is that there seems to be a trend back to uh, to uh, people going to going to a central place and casting their vote. And, and I think a lot of people will want to do that, and it's right that they should have the opportunity. So I wouldn't be I would I wouldn't be I, I certainly personally would not be keen on an all postal election. Yeah, and I think it's important to be able to give people the choice as to how they wish to do ahead of the independence <coughs> referendum in 2014. Certainly in my own local area, we saw people were actually cancelling their postal vote because they wanted to vote in person. They wanted to feel they were taking part. It, 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 comes down, it can come down to just an emotive issue, is that? Yeah. And um, in terms of electronic voting, what, um, what's your views on the if you like pros and cons I mean obviously security is the issue that's been raised time and again there are countries across the world using electronic voting to varying degrees of success um, and obviously questions around the integrity of the process is, uh, are the main concerns but I'd just be interested to hear your views on the EMB starts from the, the voter being at the heart of the process and it's critical that there is voter confidence in, the, in whatever system uh, is adopt or systems w we adopt. Uh, the, the EMB uses as a strap line you know, to deliver a result that will be, that will be trusted as accurate. And there is, as you say, many, um, much doubt about... Uh, about how electronic voting systems can be, influ can be influenced and can be uh, can be abused, and some of that is impossible to prove or to say. It's like pr ask, you've been you, you're genuinely been asked to prove prove that something hasn't happened, which is pretty difficult uh, if there's no evidence that it has. But um, doing things electronically is part of life now, and I think the demand for it is likely to increase. Uh, I have a personal view, and it's, it's a, of course it's all a matter of policy that uh, even voting electronically f for the reasons of the, se of the security and the safety of the voter and to ensure that the vote is as influence-free as it can be, people should still have to go to a central point and vote electronically. That, that, needn't, be, that needn't have all the... Um, that, that could be in places which people frequent uh, often. But... There must be confidence, and before we take any before we take any steps, we must conduct these pilots. Perhaps even before we do that, we should take we should commission some research about how confident people would feel in voting in a particular way. But it's certainly efficient. It certainly um, it, it could conceivably, I suppose, reduce the cost of the electoral process, which is always a factor, not the primary factor, but it's a factor. And it is increasingly how people expect to conduct their, their public business. Okay. okay, thanks, Neil. And Maureen, do you have something else? Um, yes, just on postal voting, I don't know about um, the Western Isles, Mr Burr, but uh, I know in Shetland, for example, that some islands have complete postal voting. I wonder if you noticed whether the turnout was higher when it's all postal voting? I'm certainly casting my mind back to, to my days in Orkney, uh, where some of the islands, I think it's now more of the islands, have, uh, have, have all postal voting. Um, the turnout was certainly high. I, I, can't, I can't remember uh, the statistics. I mean, generally, the turnout of postal voters is, is higher than the, than the rate through, through polling stations. There's no doubt about that. OK, thank you. And Maureen, do you have something about the MB as well? All oh, right, OK. Um, so, um, in your written evidence, you indicated that the various organisations that you represent are supportive of extending the remit of the ele Electoral Management Board. Could you say a little bit about the informal work that the EMB has done to date for Scottish Parliament elections and explain why a formal role uh, at those elections would be beneficial? 
Yes, I'm hap happy to do that. I should, of course, declare an interest as convener of the, <laughs> convener of the MB. You may think I would say this, but no, Jed, thankfully, others have, have given evidence uh, in support of what the EMB uh, does. I mean, at, at the moment, as you know, our statutory uh, remit is for local government elections, but we have become, uh, can I say, the repository of advice, promotion of good practice and guidance and support to, uh, to the electoral community in the delivery of all elections in Scotland and the one currently uh, in process is no different. Uh, people are, are looking for well, support directions. We don't give directions, of course. We just give recommendations in respect of other elections. But we are the Electoral Management Board for Scotland. We're established uh, under an act uh, of, the, of this parliament. So it makes sense, I would suggest, that uh, the work we do for local government elections in, in, in Scotland is, is, is extended to the work for the, is to, to Scottish Parliament elections. It's just a natural progression, and it's almost assumed that we have that role, uh, certainly by the electoral community. And it's a role we're happy to, we're happy to, to take on, uh, provided um, the resources are there to deliver it. Okay, and um, we understand that there's already been some agreement reached uh, with the Scottish Government on the rec funds required uh, to the EMB's um, enhanced remit. Um, I suppose my question <coughs> is, are, are these sufficient? You're probably going to say no, but um, <laughs> are there any other resource requirements that you might wish to highlight? highlight? Well, the, the EMB has always operated at minimal cost. I mean, I, I've certainly, my, my predecessor as convener and, and, uh, and, and myself, we are not interested in offices and brass plaques and, you know, highly ex expensive, uh, expensive accoutrements, as it were, of, of, of what we do. Uh, and it is a, a lot of voluntary effort. I have to say I have a, I have a very tolerant council uh, as regards the, the time that is, that is required to carry out these duties, and, and they are in that sense voluntary. <coughs> Uh, so all I, I all I would be looking for is an open ear uh, to any financial support for, say, backfilling of posts that are of posts that are required um, from from councils uh, and indeed others uh, to undertake the work of the board. That 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 is all. I mean, we we have a very harmonious relationship with government on on, on the funding, which is minimal. Uh, it is. It's, it's not. It's less than. It's about one hundred and twenty thousand a year, which is not not expensive for what for the importance of the function we perform. But I would just be looking for an open ear to further requests on a business case basis. <coughs> okay. Thank you. And thanks very much for that. Um, okay. It's Jamie, do you have some questions here? Not on the eighteen months. I think it's no. It's uh, Gil, then. Gil. Thanks very much. Uh, I wonder. Uh, do you have any comments on the proposals in the bill which affect the operation of local government boundary commission uh, for Scotland, and are there administrative con uh, consequences to boundary changes? We've stated very strongly that um, the determination of boundaries should be on the same principles as as other elements of the delivery of elections, i.e. they should be transparent and they should be independent uh, and they, should be, they shouldn't be directly accountable through the political process. So, and what's in the bill, I think, preserves these principles. Um, we're, we're generally supportive uh, of of what's said there, and the and indeed on the the, the freedom to to extend the uh, the electoral wards where that's thought to be necessary. Um, I come back to Gould in the six months as long as it's done on a schedule and as long as it's done with sufficient time <coughs> uh, to enable registration colleagues to work uh, to work with it effectively. Uh, we we think the current system and what's proposed in the bill meets these fundamental requirements. Just to agree that point, it is important that we've got time to actually amend the registers, implement any um, reviews ahead of a, um, an electoral event. Uh, these, there is uh, a fair amount of work involved <coughs> in recasting um, ward boundaries and things to make sure that all the properties are in the correct wards and everything. That is a, a fairly intensive process, so we would certainly want to see that um, at least six months in advance of any electoral event. 
Uh, and would you like to comment on the, the bill suggesting that maybe we in increase the number of councillors that are in a particular in particular wards? Uh, two to five would be the figure. Just w w does that cause any consequence for 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 for, for you? Um, not uh, not really. As I uh, wearing one of my other hats. Um, my, my council with Orkney and Shetland and others has promoted the Island Scotland Act, which, is, as many of you will know, actually allows for one-member wards in exceptional circumstances. And we were... Uh, Solace, too, was very supportive of that, of flexibility. But we have to recognise it's a balance between local representation and natural communities and, of course, political balance, because the, the fewer the the fewer the number of members per ward, uh, the less proportionality uh, there is. And, and it's important that that, that that principle is maintained. But I think uh, some wards are simply so big under the three and four member system that it can be argued, although it can't be proved, that that's perhaps uh, disencouraging to, to candidates. And um, the flexibility at that end, I think, is particularly welcomed and not just for islands. Similarly, uh, if, if there is a town of a certain level of population that would comfortably accommodate five members rather than four, it would seem pointless just to shave off a part of it simply, simply to preserve numerical parity. So um, yes, I think, I think that flexibility is to be welcomed and would be welcomed by local authorities too. Do, do you think it would uh, maybe perhaps uh, a impact on on the populace itself and give a better kind of, especially in areas that you talk about yourself in very remote areas that are widespread, uh, some of them are huge, uh, there's a potential, or do you believe there's a potential of disengagement because of the low numbers over a vast area? I think it. I think people still identify with councillors for, for their area, mm. and their area is a matter of, reason of their perception, really. And I think it it is a system works best when people feel, uh, they have, they are being represented by someone who is resident in, and uh, knows and, and is cognizant of the boundaries of their area. So I, I think on the whole, it's a it's that that flexibility is to be desired. Um, recognising that another purpose of the system is to ensure political proportional representation. Yeah. And a, a similar theme, um, her, there has been discussion uh, during this process in the committee work that we're doing in regards to the prospect of uh, candidates rather than being in alphabetical order, that, that there is some other method used. And I wondered what your thoughts were on that, both uh, how it would affect, uh, particularly in s someone that's got experience directly uh, in the local authority and all that, that happens there, with engagement with councillors and the public. So how that would impact uh, uh, in a number of ways, and I won't spell them out, and w what administrative uh, problems would that bring if, if the system was changed? It's a very interesting uh, subject, and the Electoral Commission, as you, you, you'll be aware, has, has conducted some research, uh, which I think surprised probably some of us who, who, read, who read the results of it, that, uh, that apparently voters, some voters didn't appreciate that the ballot paper was alphabetical, uh, others it didn't bother them in the least, uh, and they felt it was it was perfectly natural that it should be. Um, the, the electoral, ma it is a matter of policy, of <coughs> course, it, it's a matter, but uh, on a personal view, I, I certainly would not support the alternate <coughs> A to Z, Z to A. I think that would be quite detrimental to, um, to voters with, um, with special needs, many of whom like to memorise the ballot paper and effectively vote on that. So, whether whether it's A to Z or whether it's randomised, um, there should be one there should be one um, one ballot paper for the convenience of voters that they can look at it before they go into the polling booth. And many do, and think, right, I'm putting my mark or marks uh, here and there. 
um, the evidence that I don't think is conclusive as to whether it's positively detrimental to candidates lower in the alphabet, uh, but we would welcome further. We would welcome some further engagement on that. It's it's not, I think, a point that's been that's been proved beyond doubt. But we're mm -hmm. we're certainly open to looking at the evidence. And uh, as I say, the purpose is always around the voter. What uh, the purpose of all this is to put the voter at the heart of the process. And if it if it if it in, increases that um, likelihood, then we should then we should consider it. Solman, have you any comment in that regard? No, I mean, it, I, I'm really concerned with the registers rather than... Yeah, I, I didn't want to sort of uh, leave you on the sidelines. Uh, <laughs> I, I hear what, what, uh, what you're saying in regards to... Uh, and you've, you've concentrated your comments uh, to me in regards to how it affects people, but uh, there's another question that we, we've got to consider. What consequence do you believe if we did change the system? to a non-alphabetical system, what would that do to the cost and the administrative uh, pressure that it might bring uh, in this regard? Uh, it would depend what, what method was adopted. Uh, certainly if, if there were alternately ordered ballot papers, if I can put it that way, that would certainly slow down the count. It would increase the costs. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And there would be probably unmeasurable... It would It would make the life of the polling staff more difficult, I would suggest, because they will be they will be faced with questions of why is why am I getting a different ballot paper from from the from the person next to me, what's going on here? Um I so I, and you've heard my, my personal view and it's only that that, that that there should be one ballot paper, whether randomized or, or alphabetical. <coughs> I have to observe, I once produced a ballot paper in the Western Isles where all the candidates had the same surname. So <laughs> <laughs> randomization does not always help. I thought, I thought that was the best example of randomization. <laughs> Give everybody the same name. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. No, that's, that's, that's actually quite interesting. Um, and Jamie, you did have something earlier, please. Yeah. I know you've got a specialisation in this. Well, it was just you expertly predicted, Malcolm, my question I was going to ask about the Islands Act and the single um, single uh, councillor um, areas. Are you aware of any, um, uh, either the Western Isles or any of the other so the uh, councils covered by the Islands Act that are looking at the potential um, for one-member wards at the moment or considering them? Certainly, my own council is, but only one, only for the island of the islands of Barra and Vatasey, which are obviously separated by sea uh, from the other part of their current ward, which is South Uist, and have a very strong local identity. Um, so we are, we have suggested, we have suggested to the commission that uh, in in that area alone uh, there should be a single member ward. Okay, um, just just uh, if I can come very the qu the questions you were just talking with Gil Patterson about, um, you talked about the additional perhaps burden on polling staff given uh, in the Highlands and Islands regions. Some of those can be extremely remote and have to cover large areas. Would you consider there needing to be any more specialist support in those polling stations um, for for people if the if the ballot is more? I don't want to say confused, but if it if it's different, uh. I, I think there I think there would yes, particularly if ballot papers were not to be the same. Mm -hmm. I think that would require uh, we would probably look to appoint certainly I would an additional polling clerk to help voters through the process and and answer the questions so that the the presiding officer and the polling clerk can get on with uh, issuing the papers in the right way. Um, without without distractions, so I think in the early stages of such a system, there certainly would need to be uh, additional support, and for postal voters, okay. uh, one can imagine a um, a husband and wife, for example, receiving two different ballot papers. Mm -hmm. One can imagine then phone calls to the office about yeah. what's happening here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And just a quick question, Mark Roscoe, please. Yeah, I mean, obviously the committee is looking at the franchise bill at, at the same time. Um, if the franchise bill extended the right <coughs> to vote to those people seeking asylum, would that cause any issues for you in terms of electoral registration? Because it's, it's declaratory, isn't it? I mean, you, you fill out your form and you're resident in a house. Well, I, I think, it, I think um, it would 
cause us administrative difficulties. I think um, for somebody who, uh, what we like uh, from an administrative viewpoint is something that is clear. So if somebody has a, a clear right, they have a visa or whatever to remain in the, in the uh, United Kingdom, even if it's for a defined period. That's something that's very easily for us to verify very quick. So if there's any challenge or any question, we've got documentary evidence that can actually support that process. For somebody seeking asylum, they don't. We would have to look at the facts. Were, how long had they been resident in Scotland? How long were they going to be resident in Scotland? Were they, were they sufficiently permanently resident in Scotland to meet the residence criteria for the Representation of the People Act? That would could be very difficult and very complex, and begins to almost take us into immigration territory. And I think that could be quite challenging for electoral registration officers. So you'd want clarity in terms of the st the legal status of the asylum seeker and some some sort of administrative so, yeah because, uh, card we, 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 or document where you could go that's fine we'll accept that yes that it's proof that the person has got a a, a degree of permanency of residency in scotland because it isn't just being able to be resident for a day it's being having a, yep. a sufficient permanency that you are are, are deep resident okay. So, yeah, that, that's the type of thing we would be yeah. looking for. Okay, thanks. And uh, Jamie, just on that? Yeah, it was actually, and, and again, uh, Mark's asked kind of the question I was looking to ask, but also I just wanted to widen it out, because one of the concerns I had during, during uh, our, our evidence that we took on, on, the, um, on the other bill um, was, the, um, was the, the register and how you could uh, essentially uh, check residency and some of the issues. How confident are you in the... Uh, in the register in that it is accurate that there isn't duplication that the, the the checks can be done to make sure that the people who are on it are largely should be entitled are largely entitled to vote uh, the, the register is, is a fluid document as i said mm. at the last uh, yeah. last time it is a living document yeah. but it's one of the few databases that actually gets an annual audit there is an annual canvas there is a communication to every household saying is this information still right mm. There is also an internal mechanism through the government digital service. So if I register somebody in my area and they've given a previous address, say, in Glasgow, mm -hmm. that the, um, the computer systems are linked so that my colleague in Glasgow is notified that I've now registered them in my area mm -hmm. and they should look to remove them. So that process is there in place. It is to check everybody's duplicate uh, thing there are as you as it's been highlighted already there are some people who legitimately yeah. duplicate registered so you'd have to wade through all that to check it and at any point in time the, the register is in a safe flight some people could potentially be on one address mm -hmm. and another simply just down to timing they've registered in one area they haven't quite come off in another one so um that that there in terms of um if we've got um, doubt about whether somebody has leave to remain in the United Kingdom, there is a mechanism where we can contact the Home Office, supply the details, and within five days they will come back and advise us whether the person does have leave to remain. Um, that will happen where there's some trigger, somebody challenges something that uh, they think maybe is not right. And, Sorry, um, when you say somebody challenges, you mean...? Yes, I mean, uh, we do get challenges to registration, so... Um, uh, part of the registration process is when somebody registers at a property, particularly if we've not invited them um, by law, we have to write out to the property physical letter goes out very, very occasionally, and it's very low numbers indeed. In my area, probably might be one or two a year. We all get somebody coming back saying that person isn't actually living at this address. Right, okay. And then we will conduct what we call as registration review. Um, we'll invite the person to contact us, supply us evidence, we'll write to the property. And indeed, if necessary, we will hold a hearing and ask the person to come along and prove their residency or property. So those checks do exist within the system. Okay, I was wondering whether it was somebody, you know, curtain twitching and dobbing in their neighbour or something. Well, like you can't, I mean, that, that uh, and well, I um, the, any application and any uh, to go onto the register is open for public inspection. Mm -hmm. And there's a five-day objection period by which we can't just add people onto the register until that objection period is run mm -hmm. to allow for somebody to say, actually, I don't think that that person should be added to the register. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, just uh, it's a wee bit unusual for you, possibly. We didn't give you an opportunity to open with a statement, um, and you may not think this is your actual role, but are there any matters which are not addressed in the bill um, which you think maybe would be useful if they were included from your area of expertise? Um, 
I wouldn't say so. I mean, the, 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 what's in the bill, of course, is, is a policy matter. But but we look at the, the board looks at all electoral legislation on the basis of accessibility for the voter, consistency, efficiency, integrity uh, of the process. Uh, will it promote good practice? Um, is it is it practical to administer? Will it help? Will it help the democratic process? Um, and will it produce an undue burden on, on those of us who run elections? And this bill, as you, you will have seen from our response, we are largely we are supportive of the provisions of this bill if it's, if it's brought in in the right way. And I've come back to the Gould principle that um, six months uh, yeah. is a good minimum time uh, for, in for, in for introduction of any changes um, that relate to, to an election uh, that's reasonably foreseen. Thank you. And yeah, for me, yeah. I think the registration ones they picked up. The, the we, we welcome this the, the uh, change to the fixing of the attainment age at 14. I think any type of electoral, it is a, a moving process at this point in time. The bill covers what we need it to. But if you look back, the register, as I said, was um, only published once a year, updated once a year. We now update it monthly. I would like to see. Um, going forward in the future at some point we've moved to a life register that's updated on a daily basis and within five days of applying you're on the register that maybe it's time to think and things maybe not precisely at this moment but these mm. these things evolve and, and go forward great thank you very much um well thanks uh, both to malcolm Barr and to pete wildman um you've given us some very very uh, good and in-depth argument and discussion and uh, if there's anything at all you would you want to write to us about then again then uh, please feel free to do so but thank you for coming in thank you very much thank you and uh, that's us uh, thank you ending the first public part of the meeting so if the public would care to leave also uh, that would be great thanks very much for that that's good <laughs>